Yeah, I'm Heino Falke. I'm professor of radio astronomy and astroparticle physics from the Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands. And I'm passionate about black holes and a lot of other things in the universe, from the small scales to the biggest scales. And I was deeply involved in the first image of a black hole that was published two years ago. And I wrote a book about it, about the personal journey that I made with this experiment, and also about the, the journey that we made as an humankind from the first view towards the stars, which must have been as fascinating at the time thousands of years ago as it is still today, if we still find a quiet and dark spot somewhere in our neighborhood. <laughs> yeah, indeed, indeed. It's becoming um, increasingly difficult to, to get away from um, sort of light pollution and find dark, dark, dark places. But um, I, I sort of thought it'd be interesting to start the, the, the podcast with um, something that you've probably been asked loads of times. Um, can, can you give us a, a, a simple explanation as to what exactly a black hole is? Just enormous amount of matter compressed into a tiny amount of space, which means that gravity and space-time curvature, which is you know, Einstein's great idea about explaining <laughs> gravity, becomes so extreme that everything that comes too close will never be able to escape. And that's why it's a black hole. It's not really a hole, right? It's, it's, it's a lot of stuff, but it's a hole in space and time because it really punches a hole into our observable universe. There's something around this universe, in this universe, around this black hole that we cannot see and measure with current technology, maybe never. And that's why this is a dark and mysterious region shielded by an event horizon that, where nothing escapes. Yes, now that uh, event horizon, is, it, if I might, that, that's the point beyond which not, nothing can escape. Yes. So if you have matter collapsing, you have a big star exploding and it collapses into a black hole, you know, it, there is no force that can stop that collapse because as more matter piles up and is quenched together, the force of gravity just becomes stronger and stronger and wants to pull it together even more. And there is you know, no force that can stop this. And at some point it collapses into a point. And then surrounding this is this region where this is a perimeter, so to speak. And it's not just a, a line, it's actually a, a sphere, so to speak, a virtual sphere in, in space, where if you cross that border, you'd never be able to come back. And that's true for yourself if you walk into it, but it's also true for light. If it falls into a black hole, we'll never be able to come out. And so no information, nothing that goes in is able to come out, at least according to the theory of gravity. Hawking had some other ideas about it. I often think it's really interesting um, when um, astrophysicists and scientists talk about space-time, like space and time are, are sort of um, uh, intertwined to the point at which they, are, you know, they sort of um, can't, can't really be separated when you're, when, when you're talking about how they behave. So whenever you sort of hear about them, um, you know, mass warping space-time and, and, and um, you know, so the, all that gravitational lensing and things like that. Um, what's the... What's the physics behind that? So is a black hole so dense that it can actually sort of warp and, and curve time itself? At least it's a theory that Einstein proposed to explain uh, the nature and the, the mysterious force of gravity. And it all boils down to the properties of light. Because if you think about what is space and what is time, have you ever touched space? Have you ever touched time? That's something you can you can, you know, kind of get a grip on? How do, how do you experience it? You measure it. You measure it with a device. And sometimes it's yourself. And you know time is relative. Sometimes you know, it takes, you know, the same a few seconds can, you know, feel like, like ages. And others go by way too fast. But on, in the, uh, on, on the basic level, you're always measuring space and time with light. And light is actually the only thing that's constant in the universe, you know, if you talk about space, uh, space and time. And that's, that was a big realization of, of Albert Einstein, and he took that serious, that light always moves with the same speed. And that was deeply, deeply put and, and deeply ingrained in our theories of physics today, in, in the theory of, of light, in, in the theory, of course, of, of gravity, in, 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 in the theories of, of information and everywhere, light always travels with the same speed. And, and what is speed? Speed is 
lengths divided by time, miles per hour, kilometers per hour. Okay, so the ratio between the two is fixed, but individually the two can change. And um, so when you think of gravity as a change in space, you know, gravity of, of, of a body leads to a deformation of space, then suddenly the length scale changes. Light has to travel a longer, longer path, okay? But then also time needs to change to, ever keep, to keep the velocity the same. Or at least what you measure as time changes. Because indeed, indeed, time is a derived quantity. It's not inherent to something. It's something that you always measure by a clock. How, qu how quickly is a clock ticking? And the, on the fundamental level, the, clicking of a uh, the, the, the ticking of a clock is really the, the oscillation of the light waves or similar types of, 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 of waves. And uh, that changes as you go through curved space. And so you can never separate space and time if you take the fact series that, that, that light is really what defines everything and that light, the speed of light is constant. And that's something we just measure. I mean, it sounds weird, but something it was measured and it was, it was also baked in into the equations of Maxwell and others. And we use it every day and we don't really know about it. And without that principle that the speed of light is constant, many of the things of the physics wouldn't, just wouldn't work. So it was a logical consequence in the end. Uh, that space and time is relative, but it took a long time for us to realize it. I think that a lot sort of um, what I would regard anyway as uh, complex, you know, physics and theoretical physics. Although you, although you've you've put it on un uh, unbelievably succinctly and <laughs> and, and simply, um, it just makes that that image of the um, black hole in, in Galaxy M eighty seven that you know was was captured by by you and the team uh, about two years ago. It just makes it all the more mind blowing. I mean, if if not even light can escape from from a black hole, um, how how is it possible to 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 photograph a black hole to capture an image of a black hole? I was wondering if you could just go, go all the way back and sort of explain um, a bit, little bit about how that that project came about and the actual science in, involved. Yeah, how how can you photograph a dark hole in a dark wall at night? You can't, right? There's no way to see it. <laughs> what you have to do is you have to shine light at it. Right? The light will disappear in the hole and the light surrounding and, and the wall surrounding it will actually light up. And something like that is happening uh, with, with black holes in general. Because if you look into them, you know, what we're seeing in this picture is this dark region in the very center. You're looking really into the darkness of the event horizon. That's where light disappears. But surrounding it is an enormous amount of light. And that comes from the fact that there is Universe not, is not empty. Matter is falling into the black hole. It's heating up. It's actually rotating with the speed of light. It's some of the, the hottest material you can find is around black holes, and they make an awful amount of radiation and light. And so it shines upon itself, these, these, these black holes. And some of the light is, escapes, and we can measure it, and some of the light disappears in the darkness. And that's what we can see in the end. Of course, in our case, it was radio light. But that is light, like uh, the light we see. It's just a different frequency. It's just a color that we don't really know yet as humans. We measure it with, with devices, but uh, it, 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 it is light that's, that's produced near, near the black hole. And um, you know, I, I was starting my physics studies and was thinking about black holes. And then like, like you and many others, it was just like totally fascinating, mysterious. But, Unbelievable objects, really, right? So they, everything seems so strange. You you hear that time slows down, almost actually comes to a standstill. That light just disappears, nothing comes out, and all these things you can you, you travel around with speed of light, and, and you know that, that looks really, it sounds really exotic. And uh, but then there was evidence that these things might actually exist in the universe, and that was just you know in the in the 90s, this was a, a paradigma, but a thought, but we hadn't really established it that this is true. And I wanted to see it. And then there was this realization that there, in some cases, you actually can see it. If a black hole is very, very big and it's very, very close, and you look at the right radio frequency, then it will actually, the light will come from right next to the event horizon. And you should be able to see that ring. And we had just also built in the radio astronomy community where I'm coming from, 
had built the techniques to possibly do this. We just had to extrapolate that to much higher precision and higher frequencies than uh, what we were doing in, in the 90s. So you put things together and say, wow, we may be able to see a black hole, actually. You know, these mysterious objects. And that what really drove my, you know, my passion and my, yeah, my life for the next 20, 25 years. <laughs> How did you decide to, to aim for the, the black hole in, in galaxy M87? That's to some degree luck. So when we published our first paper saying, you know, we can take a picture of the black hole, we were thinking of the black hole in the center of our galaxy in the Milky Way, because there we know exactly how big the mass is. And around the same time, people were measuring also other black holes like M87. But then it seemed that the mass was just too small, right? You have a certain limited resolution. And that resolution is actually set by the size of the Earth, because we need a world-sized telescope to see a black hole. And that's what we did in the end. But you cannot make the world much bigger easily, right? You have to go to space, but that's very expensive. So <laughs> the size of the Earth sets a resolution. And it seemed that M87 was just a bit, tiny bit too small, a factor two too small. And so we were gearing up for this experiment to look at the center of the Milky Way. And then slowly in the next couple of years, actually 10 years and two decades, <laughs> M87, <laughs> the mass seemed to become bigger and bigger. Groups were measuring again and again and say, hmm, you know, if I take my data serious, this thing should be as massive as six billion times the mass of the sun. And that, that's in itself in incredible. I already found the original number of two to three billion almost <laughs> incredible. But that just made it just barely resolvable. You know, we might have a shot at it. We weren't quite sure. And then we tried in, 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 in 2017. We did the center of the Milky Way and we did M87 just to see what it would look like. Well, and a year later, I saw the first data. <laughs> and when you saw that data, I just fell from, from, my, from my chair. I mean, actually, I wasn't on a chair. I was standing. I, was, I think I was just floating above the ground for about an hour. I said, <laughs> this is so cool. I hope this is right. Um, because it meant that we had seen the shadow and that ring. And of course, what followed was a year of hectic and painful investigations of whether we did things right uh, with this big collaboration of 250, and that 350 people actually were involved in this entire experiment. And uh, many sleepless night, but, but a very energetic team of many young scientists who put uh, days and night into investigating this. Yeah, one of the really interesting uh, things that you said there, which I wanted to pick up on, was um, that the, the, the telescope was the size of the Earth. Because uh, as I understand it, wasn't it, it, it was sort of, um, it was like an, almost like a, an international array of radio telescopes. So you're connecting telescopes around the world to create one massive telescope? Is that, is that sort of the idea? Absolutely. And this is actually an old idea called interferometry, radio interferometry. It was even a Nobel Prize for this in the, in the 70s in the UK. And um, for the, uh, Martin Ryle got this, this Nobel Prize for, in, for inventing uh, interferometry. And that was an ingenious idea. You would be able to Rather than build a big telescope, because the bigger telescope, the bigger the resolution, you could use smaller telescope, separate them, and then you connect them electronically. First with just cables, like coax cables, you would then bring the light waves together. Why are these cables? And then later, it was realized we can do this on even a bigger scale. We can separate telescopes over entire continents or even across you know, the entire world. And then we, we record the data locally, and then we later bring the data together when what we have recorded. Initially, people recorded the radio wave on, uh, on videotape, yeah? and then on these big computer tapes. And now we record them on hard drives. We actually store light on hard drives these days, and we can send it over via the internet. But we're having so much data that we still have to use hard drives to, <laughs> to, to uh, store all our data and handle our, all our data. And then you can synthesize a telescope in your computer. And you do exactly what a normal telescope would do. Uh, and we, yeah, we can do this because we have an, enough data processing power. We can do this in the radio. We cannot do this in, with light waves um, because they are too high frequency, too much data, and they have a quantum nature. But with radio waves, you can do this. We can just you know, store them on hard drive and then do with them whatever we like. And we can form a virtual telescope and we do what a world-sized telescope would do. <laughs> it's absolutely incredible. Um, 
Just it is, it is, the... and it's 40 years of work and, and more that went into this from an entire community of radio astronomers. And uh, not the least, in fact, in the UK, which is, has always been the leading country in terms of radio astronomy since, uh, since World War II, which I think goes back, as I, if I remember, to the Royal Air Force. You know, they, <laughs> they, their knowledge was built up in trying to find German, German fighter planes and developing radar technology and so forth. And so that's where the original knowledge came from. They used it then for astronomy right after the, the war. Yes, that's right. Um, it's the, the story of um, <clears throat> uh, UK listeners will be uh, familiar with their Jodrell Bank um, Observatory in, in Cheshire in the UK. And uh, I think Sir Bernard Lovell had um, begun using old World War II radio equipment to... Yeah, he, he was he, he was in RAF and, and, and he, he had this idea. He saw something during the war that he wanted to follow up with in, in terms of physics. I think it was a cosmic rays even. He wasn't thinking of black holes. He was thinking of something completely different. And uh, he wanted to follow this up after the war with, with radio dishes. And it turned to something completely, you know, something completely different. But then, you know, the, these big dishes were built, the big Lovell telescope, there's an Effelsberg telescope, and the, the Parkes telescope, these big dishes. But they are giants, and you can't make them bigger. And then the idea came, we, let's do interferometry, let's separate them, let's bring them together. If we use the perspectives from the entire world, we can actually make a world, world-sized telescope. And, and that made it possible. I think this is really an amazing story how out of, I mean, something as terrible as, as World War II, in the end, something came out which was beneficial for science and people actually started to work together across borders and across countries. So there's always some hope, I think, in, in, to find in, in, in this story. Definitely. Um, when we look at that um, image of um, the M87 black hole, uh, what are we actually seeing in terms of the, the orange ring? And, and why is it sort of thicker and brighter and, and wider uh, at the bottom? Yeah, we've, this, it actually looks pretty much like we predicted it before. You see, again, you see the darkness, which is the event horizon, the light disappearing in, in the event horizon. And then light is actually bent around the black hole. In our simulations, what we see is light can even go on a circle. Light could go in a closed circle almost uh, around the black hole because the, the force of gravity is, is so strong. And so that's what we're seeing. We're seeing light being bent by the black hole as a big uh, gravitational lens, so to speak. And uh, the plasma around the black hole is, is still rotating, right? It's still rotating with, with almost the speed of light. And then, you know, the stuff that comes towards us will be appear a bit brighter because the light is actually beamed. It actually gets a push <laughs> because it, the, the matter itself is moving almost with the speed of light. The, 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 the light itself cannot move faster than speed of light, as, as I just explained, but you can sort of you know, pile up light. You can uh, it give it more energy. And so that, that part that you're looking into that comes towards you will appear brighter to you, will also radiate at some, somewhat higher frequencies. And so we think that the lower part of this ring is something that rotates towards us. But of course, we only had one snapshot. You know, we, 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 we took one particular picture in one week in 2017. And we know that the black holes can change their appearance. So that stuff could move around. It could have been that just by accident, a big blob was brighter on one side. So we would have to average really of a number of turns to really get this sorted out very clearly. But uh, it looks quite tantalizing. And um, as I said, it looks really almost exactly as, we, as, as it was predicted and calculated before, which, which doesn't happen that often in astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> there was another image that um, came out um, about a week ago as we were recording, and it was um, the, the M87 black hole, but um, in, in polarized light. So it's sort of showing the uh, magnetic field. Yeah, uh, so you're not seeing the magnetic field. You see actually the, the, the uh, direction within which the light is oscillating. You don't know this usually in your daily life, and you don't notice it that light oscillates, but it can oscillate like from left to right or up and down. And using a special filter, like, like sunglasses, for example, sometimes do this, you can pick out which light you want to see, the one going from left to right or the one going up and down. Then you see only half the light. Your cell phones actually will produce polarized light. So if you use your, your polarized sunglasses and turn them around, you will actually see different reflections and parts on your, your cell phone. So that's something that is you know, not very present in our daily lives, but it, it is there 
in every light you look at is, is polarization information. So that's a hidden information. And the same is going on in black holes. The light that we measure is polarized. And um, where does this come from? What determines which direction these, the light waves are oscillating? It's the direction of magnetic fields. Because how is radio emission uh, produced? Well, it's sort of electrons going up and down or left or right. And near black holes is strong magnetic fields, electrons going around the magnetic fields. And so that tells you then uh, the polarization direction and the direction of magnetic fields. In fact, if you look at these there are fine lines now that we plot on this image that, that we showed, this, this shows the direction of polarization. And the magnetic fields are roughly perpendicular to that. Absolutely incredible. I think it's it, it's worth actually also talking about, um, because because all, all this... Um, information and the story of the how the black hole was captured is, is all is all part of your new book which is how our, our paths are sort of crossed um your book uh, um light in the darkness um which is um going to be coming out i think around about the time this podcast is is out um i was wondering yeah, if you could talk a, bit, a little bit about what what that title means light in the darkness and what the what the book itself is about well I, to me Looking at this black hole is a bit of an end point, but also the beginning of something new. If you think about how we started as humans, we were looking up at the night sky and we saw these light coming in, this light in the darkness. And it was always telling us something, there's something bigger, something more fascinating, something deeper out there. And I think the same feeling we still have today as astronomers, but also as, as, as amateurs and, and just, you know, average people, we look at the sky and, and this, this light tells us about something deeper and more meaningful. And we learned so much physics, so much about our universe, about our, of the nature of space-time from, from just a little bit of light um, that, that, that really drove the, a lot of development of our, yeah, of humanity, I think. And, and so I tell a little bit the story of, of astronomy from this, this first view until the end. And, and now I have a bit of the feeling we've gone almost all the way. We've looked at the beginning of space and time, the Big Bang. We've looked at the light from the Big Bang. We are looking now at the end of space-time, black holes, the end of space and time, and everything in between. Yes, there's still so much more to discover, but we've really you know, gotten to the absolute limit of space and time. And then the big question is, what's next? You know, are we ever able to transcend those boundaries? I mean, think about it. You know, would you have thought about two and a half thousand years ago, you, you can really see the universe in the making in, in the Big Bang and, and something as crazy as black holes. And, and what, what's, what's still for us to come? And I think that's an interesting question because I'm not able to answer this because, you know, physics right now tells us there is a fundamental limit, right? Until here and not further, right? <laughs> and, um, but... There's always a hope that you, there's so, something new to be discovered. Maybe some new theory of gravity uh, at the edge of black holes. Um, and, uh, and so we'll keep searching. And, and, and I think that really, that's what makes us human, to search and ask the deep questions about us, the universe, uh, the origin, the meaning of life, God, and whatever. And, and uh, yeah, I try to use this, uh, this title to, to, to express... Uh, it's just not about physics, you know. It's, not, it's it's also deeply about fascination and 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 fundamental questions that we always ask. You know, I, I didn't go into astronomy just um, to to just do physics. I mean, it was always a deeper fascination that that drew me into the field. Yeah, I mean, I suppose um, your uh, your own faith must must play a large part in that because you're a, you're an ordained. Um... Christian minister, aren't you? In in, uh, in 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 your hometown in Germany? Um... Yeah, it's a yeah, it, it's a. Well, I, I was raised and born as a, a Protestant Christian, and uh, my faith means something to me. It's something that has been part of my life uh, throughout my my early days and until now as as a scientist, and it's been something that has been uh, very important to me, and and something that I think I share with. With many people throughout, again, the many generations who've not only looked at nature as some, something, but as an expression of something deeper, as an mm -hmm. expression of, of an, a, a first cause. You know, who, 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 you know, where does it all come from? Where do we go to? And to me, the, the feeling there is a, you know, a creator, a God, a, a first thing 
um, is something that 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 really gives me strengths, and also the 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 to to think about this together with with other you know fellow Christians and, and other believers to ask these questions and, and reflect on it, and to you know allow myself to be a bit spiritual as well in in in, <laughs> in light of all all the hardcore physics uh, that we do. I think that's important to for our humanity as well. Yeah, I also think it's sort of, um, you know, um, an- analyzing the universe and, and its beginning and its end and, and, and all those kind of, um, you know, theoretical cosmology and astrophysics, um, bringing in a bit of, re- of, of religion or spirituality, as, as you said, it also sort of reminds us of the, of the poetry of, of the universe and, and, and the actual beauty of, of, of things, which, do you think? Do, do, do you find, you know, as a sort of hard, hardcore physicist and, and an academic, that that there's a tendency to sort of get lost in the numbers and the maths, and, and to not, and, and you know, it helps to some, sometimes actually take a step back and 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 remember just how beautiful everything is. Absolutely, I think that that's really the point. I still remember, like when I was somewhat younger, the, the questions of you know the, the the beginning of the universe it was still present in our field and nowadays we only talk about numbers and hardcore physics that that's all fine i love it you know it's it's great but whenever i i'm allowed to give a talk to like the general public and talk about it and and the general meaning of astronomy and and you you talk about this the beauty of the universe and how this all works and the fact that we are allowed to see it and understand it i'm always awestruck you know, I stand there and it almost feels a little bit like holy <laughs> to look in the, at this universe if you step a bit back and, and you go away from the numbers and just you know, think about the, the big picture. And I have a bit of an impression that we lost a little bit the, uh, the ability to speak about this and express this also in terms that, that are not just numbers, but again, you know, express some of our spiritual feelings about this because that, that, that have shaped our universe. In fact, astronomy has been the oldest science. It came out of sort of a, you know, people trying to understand what's going on, and they were thinking about gods and so forth. And um, and of course, actually, very quickly, the, the two separated. Some people were observing the stars; the other ones were interpreting this. And um, today, we've we we don't we don't use equations to really express the meaning of life, but the question. Still, is still there, and I think theology and, and these other fields and philosophy that have been around for many centuries or shouldn't be discounted now, only because we are bad at math. <laughs> the other thing I, I keep coming back to when we're considering, you know, um, all these sort of um, cosmological queries is 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 that idea that, that that we only can really see about five percent of the universe, you know, the rest sort of being <clears throat> dark matter and dark energy. Um, how can we hope to to actually understand all those those unknowns about the universe, do, do, do you think we're, we're sort of getting any closer? That's a very good question. And indeed, the more we've looked into the universe, this is of course something we always say, but it's, it seems to be it seems to remain true. The more we look into the universe, the more questions come up, and and some we may never be able to answer. I I don't think we'll be. Phys- able to explain ever what the true origin of the universe is. I think I'm, we'll be able to understand some of the details, like what is dark energy and dark matter? <laughs> you know, sorry for, for calling it detail. <laughs> it's one of the big questions today. But I think on the large scale of things, I, I'm quite hopeful that we'll be able to understand them. And there may be some really exciting stuff behind it. <laughs> I, one, one colleague of mine once said, you know, we all think of dark matter of one thing, but maybe this dark universe is much more complex and 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 exciting than than we think, right? So m- maybe there's much more deeper deeper things hiding there, and it will definitely give us a better understanding of of, of space and time, and, and you know, and remind you, you know, if black holes, you know, we we understand them from from the theory of relativity, but we do not understand them at all from the theory of quantum. Uh, quantum physics. All right, there is a quantum theory of it, which is well developed mathematically, but has many, many different branches, many, many different ideas, and is hardly, if at all, tested. Right? So there's an entire universe that we do not understand in theory and in practice, and it's going to be very hard to observe it. So there are still challenges out there for us, 
And um, I think there may be some really exciting stuff to, to, to discover. Not everything that you see in science fiction these days will be able to, <laughs> to realize, but maybe you know, a few things that we now consider totally crazy will be quite commonplace in a thousand years. I hope so. I hope so. And I, I hope that you, know, that you and I get, get to sort of um, live long enough to, to, to get answers to some of those questions. Almost well, uh, a thousand years will be tough, but uh, <laughs> I'm pretty sure that next, even in, in astronomy every year almost something new happens. And, you know, people rightly say it's been such an amazing decade already. Uh, they're looking forward to what the next decade brings. It's, it's exciting. It's, it's, I call it this last battle that we have. I mean, either we're going to have some really exciting ones or we're actually banging, banging our heads against the wall. We're not going through. And so it, it really is an exciting time that we are going into now. Fantastic. Well, um, thanks very much for speaking to me today, Heino. And also wanted to say um, good, good luck with the book when it comes out. And, Thank you. And... Um, Good luck with your, your future research and uh, yeah, hope, hope we get to speak to you again sometime soon. Oh, I'm happy to be back.